Good morning, everyone uh, who are joining us from India and uh, an evening to the ones who are joining us from the Western part of the world. Uh, welcome to this um, session of Detox, uh, Disruptive Literacy Talks. I'm your host, uh, Mashud. Uh, as we uh, talk about how do we ensure a world where every child uh, is able to have the foundational skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic, it's important to make sure that uh, the most important, one of the most important stakeholders who will help ensure this dream of uh, universal literacy and numeracy are teachers. Uh, and how uh, how can we ensure that uh, no child is left behind? Uh, it is very important that we talk about uh, how teaching every child uh, with no child left behind can be ensured. And this is going to be uh, our today's talk. And we are very fortunate uh, to have a very special guest joining us from the United States, um, Mr. Bob Barata Lawton, who is the president of the Center for Innovation in Education USA. Um, Bob, it's an absolute honor to have you here, uh, and we are very looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. And now that I know I'm live, I'll start talking. Um, I ask that the introduction today be kept to a minimum because I'd rather have you learn about me from me. Um, there are teachers in the United States and elsewhere in the world who know the center. They know the teachers who, to, they know the two teachers who founded it and who use the center's math and reading programs, but they don't really know much about how these two teachers became teachers <clears throat> or what inspired them to create their own curriculum or how they decided what that curriculum should be. A while ago, a teacher asked me with educational philosophers, which educational philosophers or philosophies inspired our work? She gave me a list of names and my answer was none of the above. My talk today will, among other things, answer her question in more detail. Today's presentation will take about an hour and when it's done, I will add a link to this detalk video to the center's website. The center's website address is on slide four. Along with the table of contents, listing the key points and the times they occur in the video, so people watching today can find any part that interests them or that they want to share with others without having to research the entire presentation. And so people watching, not watching today and see it through the center's website link can watch it in bits and pieces of their own choosing over as many days as they want. Also, people watching this presentation in real time will have the opportunity to ask me questions at the end of my presentation. I look forward to that. I would like people watching the video later on to have the same chance to ask me questions. So I will add an email address to the table of content section that will be a, that the link will be to that they may use to contact me. That email address will be info, short for information, at center.edu. Center spelled the USA way, C-E-N-T-E-R, and E-D-U, short for education. Now, the first slide today is already on the screen. It says, basically, as you can see from the first slide, that title of my talk is Teaching Every Child with No Child Left Behind. But the rest of the title of the talk is actually and Letting Teachers Be Teaching. Let, pardon me, Letting Teachers Be Teachers. I should get my own title right. And that's what I'll be talking about today. This talk will have four parts. First, the guidelines we used, and the first evidence that the curriculum we created actually worked. Second, who these two teachers are with no educational background at all, and why we were allowed to throw everything out and start from scratch. Third, after we decided what, to, what not to do, as you'll see right away and very shortly, how we decided what to do instead. Fourth, some, exam some sample lessons from Teach Every Child curriculum. The reason talking about the actual lessons comes last is because the what makes the lessons so successful is not the lessons themselves, but the learning environment in which they are taught. First, the guidelines. Now, on my screen, these look pretty big. I don't know what kind of computer you have or what size your screen is, so I'm just gonna review these quickly in case your screen doesn't make it easier for you to read. These are the guidelines my wife Mary and I set for ourselves when we began creating curriculum. We call these our 10 no's. No textbooks, no workbooks, no worksheets, 
and the red part says the reading program uses worksheets but only in group settings. No homework, no grades, no scores, no tests, no teacher provided answers to problems, no student grouping by ability, no raising hands to answer teacher questions, and the tense no, no child left behind. The guiding philosophy, apart from the 10 no's was, none of us is as smart as all of us. With 30 children in class, each child has 30 teachers, the classroom teacher and 29 other, 29 other children as well. Now, I will tell you the reason for each of the 10 no's later on. We knew what we were not going to do, Deciding what we would do instead took a little longer to figure out. First, though, a little evidence that the curriculum I will be presiding actually works. At a school where Mary and I, pardon me, at a school where Mary was a first grade teacher and I was a fifth grade teacher, there were four fifth grade teachers. I, I should say I was a fifth grade teacher. There were four of us. Let me get this right. There were four, four fifth grade teachers. One of them was me, so there were three other ones. The principal secured funding for a fifth grade math program developed specifically to raise the test scores in inner city, low achieving schools like ours. Since the principal knew I would not use the program, he decided to use my fifth grade classroom as a control group before and after, before and after testing. Now he knew I wasn't gonna use the program because he hired me already knowing I wouldn't use it. But even so, he, basically he ran a study with me as the control group. Next slide, there. This is the fifth grade math test results from 1971 to 1972. Um, you can see I'm the Bob person. What we did was pre-test the children in October and then post-test them again in April. You can see the number of students in the pre-test. My class had 29, T class, K class, B class, 27, 31, 30 respectively. For the post-test, my class had 27. You can see what the other classes had. Now, the test, in, in all fairness to the program the principal bought, it did allow the children in the class to average a year's worth of growth. You can see that one class gained 1.3 years. One, oh, I should say that those 3.6, 3.5, 3.6, 3.4 is a way test results are shown in America for elementary grades. The 3.6, 3.5 means the children tested at the, these are fifth graders, at the beginning of fifth grade, it tested at third grade, sixth, third grade, six months, third grade, fifth month, third grade, six month, third grade, fourth month. Now, the post post test, you can see the three other classes all gained a year or better in work or in, in ability. They were still all below grade level. As an average, they were all below grade level. My class, on the other hand, had an average of 2.2 years of growth. You can also see where my top students you can also if you look you can see in my class i had only two students at fifth grade level at the start of the year my top five let's see my, my top seven students you can see by there what they were and, and i gained now obviously what we were doing was working but i found something very interesting that i didn't understand the other classrooms had lost 10 students 12 students 16 students I'd only lost two students. I was unaware that our school was a high turnover school because I, of all the years I'd been there, I never lost more than one or two students. The principal informed me when I asked him about this, you lost just as many kids as the other class when the parents were driving back to your, our school to keep them in your classroom until the end of the year. I was pleased to hear that. And as you can see in my classroom, no children were left behind. Now, Mary and I already knew our curriculum worked, and we wanted to share what we had done with other teachers. But who's going to listen to two ordinary classroom teachers and about how all children should be taught, especially teachers who, as it turns out, Mary and I had no educational background at all. As regular classroom teachers, we had no credibility, but as authors, we would. So in 1973, we began putting our math curriculum into book form. This is the center's website. Now, the www.center.edu doesn't actually appear on the website. That's basically the web address. If you have wanted to look at our website, that's its address. One of the, once the first two books were written, one for primary grades and one for intermediate, Mary and I co-founded the Center for Innovation and Education to provide support for teachers who wanted to use our curriculum in their classrooms. That same year, we also began giving workshops for teachers to let them experience our curriculum for themselves firsthand. 
We also began training teachers who wanted to be workshop instructors. To date, the center and its more than 300 instructors have provided training to more than 500,000 teachers worldwide. Now for part two. I would like to share with you who Mary and I were and are as teachers and how the two of us ended up being given permission to create our own curriculum. As for me, I never wanted to be a teacher at all. My college major was economics. In addition to my family had a very, very low opinion of teachers. Whenever I had a complaint about a teacher, my parents would say, those who can do, those who can't teach. A common phrase in the USA meant, if you can't do anything, then you can become a teacher. Now, I was planning to attend, I was planning on attending Stanford Law School in the fall, but I graduated in December and had to find a job. Actually, I wasn't planning on finding a job, but my father said, get a job. So I had to find a job from basically January through all the way to the next September while I was waiting for law school classes to begin. The job I got was as assistant swimming coach for an age group swimming team. I loved coaching so much. Wait one second. I left out that slide. This slide said age group swimming coach. Here comes the next slide. Uh, technology, I love it. At least I found how the back button works. Um, the best job at me was an, being an elementary school teacher because if I were going to be an age group swimming coach, my kids would be in school. So I had a, needed a job that would let me be in school when they were in school and out of school when they were in school. An elementary school teacher was a perfect job for me. Okay. So I decided to become an elementary school teacher, not because I wanted to be a teacher, but because I wanted to be a swimming coach. Now, I learned of a special teacher training program at the University of, the University of California at Berkeley that sounded perfect for me. As I said, my college major had been in economics and I had no, edu no educational background at all. The fact that I had no educational training turned out to be an actual requirement for a special intern program the college was running. The requirement for this program was that applicants have no background in education. Perfect. My lack of any prior training was just what this program was looking for. The program's purpose was to train teachers to work in inner city schools that serve mostly low achieving minority students. The philosophy of the program was, what's being taught now isn't working, so try something different. The reason the program didn't want anybody who was already had or had any educational training was because they didn't want us to have preconceived notions about how we should teach. Mary was also one of the intern teachers. Actually, she had applied to the program and had been turned down. However, just as the program started in June, one of the people who had been accepted had been, had been accepted was discovered not to be eligible for admission to the graduate school. So she had to drop out. Mary was the first person on the list of rejected applicants who happened to be home when our intern, super, when our intern supervisors called that day. Mary met the requirement for no educational training or background she had been training to be a librarian. All the interns would be student teachers for four weeks of summer school. And then in the fall, we'd be full-time classroom teachers. Our four weeks as student teachers would be uh, our four weeks as student teachers would be the only actual experience, teaching experience we would have before being on our own. When I met with my master teacher for the fifth grade to which I'd been assigned, she told me that she was actually a third grade teacher who'd been stuck with fifth grade class for the summer session. She said she didn't know anything more about fifth grade than I did. So she suggested that we split the workload. She would teach math and I would teach reading. I agreed. So the first day of summer school, I was already a full-time teacher. The actual assignment given to all the intern teachers was to prepare a one hour lesson to present to each of their classes on Friday of the, of the first week. My fellow, intern, my fellow interns were impressed that I was already teaching all day long while they were still worried about their first hour's lesson. Mary, who was also trying to be a fifth grade teacher like me, asked me to come to her classroom to watch her first lesson and tell, me what I, and tell her what I thought. She scheduled her presentation for my class's math time since that's when my master teacher would be teaching. Mary's lesson was a disaster. 
At the end of the lesson, Mary was leaning against the wall, nearly in tears, saying, I'll never be a teacher. I told her that what had gone I told her that what had gone wrong was easily fixable. So she agreed to meet with me that night at the, at the school library to talk about what I'd seen and how to make it better. From that night forward, Mary and I kept each other company while planning our lessons or just when we wanted good company. The reason our intern, the reason our intern teachers had needed to replace the ineligible intern rather than just let there be 23 interns instead of 24 was that four of the interns were to be part of a team teaching experiment with two teachers paired together to share a classroom. The ineligible intern was to be part of that experiment. Since Mary was taking her place, she could not be a fifth grade teacher as she wished. She was to team with another teacher in second grade. Mary is a brunette in this picture of a second, of a second grade classroom. Um, there's a reason, the reason there's a picture of Mary's second grade classroom is because the picture was taken to accompany a news article on children getting to know their local police officer. You can see the police officer's squad car in the back. Whole class pictures were not common in any of the schools where Mary and I taught. Partway through that school year, a kindergarten teaching position opened up in Mary's school. And the school's principal said Mary could have that spot if she wanted. Mary asked our intern supervisors if, they, if she could quit the team teaching and teach kindergarten instead. Their answer was no. I was a bit more persuasive, so when I asked for her, the answer was yes. And Mary became a kindergarten teacher. If I had not, in these, my, the three ifs and ifs basically is how I kind of view life anyway. If I had not ended up as an intern teacher and given and given the assignment of coming up with new with new ways of teaching, then teaching would just have been a, my side job as an age group swimming coach. And I never would have learned that teachers were just like me and I was just like them. My negative view of them as a teacher disappeared. And if that one person had not dropped out from the intern program and Mary had not been home that day, the school called, then Mary would have been a librarian. As I said, Mary and I were just two ordinary teachers with no particular teaching capabilities who just happened to be given permission to create our own curriculum. Now for the third part. The intern's program's philosophy was, what's being done now isn't working, so don't keep doing it. Try something different. Since what was being done wasn't working, I decided not to use any of the state approved textbooks or workbooks or anything else my school had given me. I would simply start from scratch. However, starting from scratch meant I would be very busy thinking of new ways to teach. So I had to abandon my desire to be a swimming coach and decided and, and instead decided to focus just being a teacher. Mary agreed with my start from scratch approach. However, her ability to try something new was not something she could do in second grade when the other teacher was not willing to abandon all the teaching materials the school had given them. When Mary became a kindergarten teacher, she was then free to do just what I was doing. Start from, pardon me, start from scratch and start making things up. For me to start from scratch, I had to think about what I knew about teaching. I had not taken any classes on how to be a teacher, but I had been a student. So what I would start by, what I would start, so I would start by doing, let me see if I can think this in my head right. I would start by looking at things from a student's point of view. Two things I knew about myself as a student. First, I was a top student. Second, I would always be a top student. I would always be a top student because the same people with me in any current grade would still be with me in the next grade. So if I was a top student in second or third or fourth grade, I would still be a top student in fifth or sixth and go on and so on up the line all the way through high school because everybody around me would still be the same. The only time I thought this might change was in college because the college I picked was filled with top students just like me. It turned out that I was a top student as a freshman, so college wouldn't be any different. What I had not given much thought to was that just like I was a top student every year, students at the bottom were at the bottom every year. And these bottom students were now the ones I would be teaching. The methods and materials that had kept me at the top were the same methods and materials that kept my bottom students at the bottom. The textbooks and workbooks I had learned with had worked for me as a student, but they would not work for me as a teacher. My goal as a teacher now was to make sure the bottom students turned into top students. 
the top students would not then somehow become bottom students. There'd just be more students at the top. My rule for myself as a teacher was then that every single child in my class would learn, no exceptions. There would be no bottom students. We would have all, we would have all tops. When I was the assistant, I like the crying girl. I, I, I happen to enjoy the crying girl story. Um, when I was a, an assistant coach on the swimming team, the head coach spent his off hours giving swimming lessons to the children. In one group of, in one group of girls the coach was teaching, one girl would start to cry every time he asked her to swim the length of the pool. She refused to even try. Once she cried, he called her a big baby. None of the other girls would swim the length of the pool either, but they didn't cry about it. One day the coach asked me to substitute teach this group of girls for him because he had another commitment. When I started the lesson, the crying girl had not yet started to cry because I had not yet asked her to do anything. I told her I wanted to swim only as far down the pool as she could swim. And as soon as she felt she couldn't swim any far, since she felt she couldn't swim any farther, she could stop put her head up and I would carry the rest of the way. She swam, she swam five or six strokes and stopped and I carried her the rest of the way down the pool. I did this for all the girls in the class. Each one of them ended up swimming a few strokes, stopping and then be carried by me to the end of the pool. Then I asked the no longer, no longer crying girl again to swim as far as she could with the same stop when you want to and I'll carry you rule. As I swam alongside of her, she swam the entire length and so did every other girl. The girls were already good enough swimmers to swim the length of the pool, but they had been afraid to eat, to try earlier because they were afraid they couldn't do it. They were afraid they would fail. All they needed me to do was to take their fear away. It was now perfectly okay to try and not make it. If they didn't make it, there was no failure involved, not even a punishment, simply a free ride to the end of the pool. So there was no harm in trying. The coach had never changed what he asked the girls to do. If they could not do what he asked, there must be something wrong with them. For me, the difference between a child succeeding and failing, failing could be as simple as changing what we ask the child to do. It could also be as simple as just taking the fear of failure away. So for me to make, the, for, so for me to make my bottom students into top students, the first thing I would have to do would be take the fear away from learning, make learning failure free. On one of my visits to India, I was fortunate enough to be asked to give a demonstration lesson to a group of children. I've often spoken to teachers, but only one other time in all my travels have I ever been asked to teach any children myself. For this occasion, the principal had my presentation filmed. The person doing the filming only filmed the first few minutes. I think he expected to film me giving a lecture to the students, but when I stopped talking and the students started working, he stopped filming. As you view this clip, I want you to think about what I as a teacher saw. And now we need, uh, oh, I'll do this. Now, what I want you to watch in this clip, I want you to watch this clip. I have, okay, watch this clip at, at the point when I fold my hands and ask the kids a question. From that point on, forward, watch the clip. It's only about two and a half minutes long. Go for it. This gentleman, one part of the team. One over 13, or one thirteen. How many um, is, is it audible? I can't hear it. It looks like how to kick play. Click play. Yeah. Okay, we'll go back to we'll go, plan B. Back to the slide. Uh, let, let's try it once more. Just let me know if you can hear it. Remember, we have a plan B if it doesn't yeah. work. I'm going to have one person who can answer, but that doesn't mean it's right necessarily. Uh, I hear there are 33. 33. Anybody have a different number? You say 35? 
You said 33. Slides back on. This is a clip I was going to show you, but we couldn't do audio for it because uh, it's the computers are next to each other and get huge squeaky loud sounds and stuff like that. So we're going to show you this one, which we just saw, and then you see that. But now I will take again because I'm going to ask you to think. I know you can answer me, but I'm going to ask you to think what I saw as a teacher. Now, the first girl who raised your hand was just like I was as a student. Counted quick, raised my hand, please call on me, please call on me. Uh, I noticed later when I watched the video, that poor girl never got called on. I wasn't peeking on her because she came first. I just didn't see her until the video. Um, the answer is given number 33, 35, 36, 41. Um, now, um, there are actually reasons why each student gave that answer. And I will just say one thing on the slide. The child in the back who said 41, you might think, what a bizarre thing for that child to say. There were teachers in the back watching this lesson. He simply counted everybody in the room. Okay, I want to defend that. The other answers have different reasons why I get numbers, but the guy in the back also counted the teachers. Okay, now it's not the variety of answers that were the focus of my attention. I'm now going to show you the first 30 seconds of the clip again and ask you to look at what the children, what the children in the first two rows do after I fold my hands and ask, ask the question, okay? Now for this, you don't need any audio for the observation. After I fold my hands, watch the kids in the first two rows, first two rows. Okay. Um, now, one second. Oh, next slide. Let's see where I am. Oh, okay. Now, what I want you to notice is that no one in the first two rows even turned around to count when I asked the question. They don't need to count because they already know where the answers are coming from. If I were to, if we were to teach every child, then we must get every child involved. If the person doing this filming had kept on filming, you would have seen what I had the class do next, next time I asked for an answer. Each child had with him or her a notebook. So for the next question I asked, I had each child write his or her answer on a page in the notebook, put the photo notebook face down on his or her lap until everyone had an answer. Once every child had an answer, I had all the children hold up their notebooks and I took the answer I saw most as the class answer for the class. 
On Mary's and my list of 10 no's was no raising hands to answer questions from teacher, teacher questions. We don't raise our hands in my classroom. Everyone answers on individual talk boards instead. Had I first asked everyone in class to tell me how many children there were in the room and write your answer on your notebook, then everyone would have been involved, pardon me, then everyone would have had a reason to count and everyone would have been involved. Now, this picture is of children in the classroom holding up their chalkboards. Um, this is not my classroom. My classroom doesn't look anything like that except for the desks. Also in this case, this is a picture taken to put in, put in the Mathematics of Way of Thinking book. Um, and if you look at the picture, you'll see every child has the same answer on his or her board. Um, that answers are not so uniform in a class. In the film clip, I ended up having to count the number of students and I came up with the number 35. However, if I had not had the students write, if I, however, if I had had the students write their answers in their notebooks and hold them up, I would have looked at all the answers and taken the number I saw the most commonly as the class answer to my question. I would not have counted the students myself at all. Since I received four different answers from the four students I called on, it is possible the class answer might not have been 35. Let's assume for a moment the class, the most common answer was 34 with the majority of students forgetting to count themselves. Then I would have declared the class answer to my question to be 34. The traditional rule for a teacher is to pronounce the correct answer, which automatically makes everyone and anyone with a different answer wrong. But if I'm going to change how my children feel about themselves, then I'm not going to grade them or mark their answers wrong. What I do instead in that situation is say, the class answer to how many children are in this classroom is 34. If you have 34 as your answer, then explain how you got your answer to someone who has a different answer than yours. If your answer is not 34, then explain to anyone around you who has 35, who has 34 why you think your answer is right and not theirs. I give my students the means to find an answer, the answer they find on their own. In my class, I do not provide answers. I teach my students how to find the answers for themselves. Finding the answers is what the students working together do. But chalkboards are only used after my students already know how to find answers. As I'm teaching them the way that answers can be found, I continue to ask them, I continue to ask them to check their neighbor's work and, each, and have their neighbor check them. If I'm to leave no child behind, having my students check each other's work lets me know which children understand and which do not. I always phrase asking children to check each other's work as checking to see if I have made myself clear. If a child doesn't understand, it's not the child's fault. I am a teacher and it's my responsibility to make sure everyone understands. As I said earlier, I was a top student. Mary was not. Mary was, at least in math, a very bottom student. As an adult, she could not subtract with any accuracy and she did not even know all her times tables. When I was in elementary school, I used to wonder why my teachers did not teach my classmates the trick I saw, the tricks I saw that made learning math so easy for me. I later learned that what my, the tricks I saw were actually the patterns in math. <clears throat> And the reason my teachers did not share what I saw with my classmates was because they didn't see the patterns either. Because Mary was so terrible at math, for us to plan our lessons together, the first thing I had to do was to introduce Mary to all the patterns to be found in math. The fact that Mary started off with so little understanding of math was actually very helpful for her when she began teaching other teachers. Mary really understood what the other teachers didn't know because she had not known it either. Because Mary now knew it, she better stunned, she understood how to help other teachers now know it too. Before I begin part four, I would like to give you the reasons behind each of our 10 no's. <clears throat> I've already mentioned no teacher provided answers and no raising hands to answer the questions. I'll talk about the other no's now. Children are born ready to learn. They start out as naturally incredible learners. Just look at the learning ability shown in every child's mastery of language. 
A baby starts out with no language at all, and just by listening to the people around it, it will learn whatever language or languages are spoken to it. Children will learn as many different languages as they hear. While I was in Iceland giving a workshop, I chatted with a child in kindergarten who spoke English with me, Hindi with her grandmother, and Icelandic with her teacher. Was she a genius? If I were a parent, I'd say yes. But as a teacher, I would say, that's just what children do. They are fast learners and slow learners. Pardon me, they're fast. Let me do my swallowing here and keep my lips. <clears throat> they are fast learners and slow learners, but there are no non-learners. <clears throat> so what happens to children when they get to school? I was born in June. My mother's sister had a daughter three months later. My three months younger cousin and I spent a lot of baby time together. And my baby progress was always compared to hers. She crawled before I did, walked before I did, and talked before I did. My parents came to the, the conclusion that I must be retarded. My father was so convinced of this that he was planning on not enrolling me in kindergarten when the time came and just taking me around with him at work. Fortunately, since I was just a baby, I did not pick up on my parents' concern. I simply learned to walk and crawl, pardon me, walk, crawl, put it out in that order, crawl, walk, and talk at my own pace, just like every other child. But when a child comes to school, their ability to learn in their own pace is taken away from them. And if, like when I was compared with my cousin, a child learns at a slower rate, he or she will be graded accordingly and made to feel that, made to feel that he or she is slow or dumb. Textbooks, workbooks, and worksheets do not even pretend to teach every child or leaving no child behind. We cannot, cannot even pretend that children in any classroom will all be ready for the same page in any book or workbook at the same time. Textbooks and workbooks are convenient ways for publishers to market their materials, but they have nothing at all to do with helping every child to learn. So if my goal is teaching every child and leaving no child behind, then textbooks and workbooks are not anything I would ever have a child use. I have never assigned any homework to my students. I teach what I want my students to know during my time with them in class. After school, children should be free to be children, hanging out with friends, playing tag or kickball or riding a bike or just being kids. If a parent asks me to assign homework, I say the best homework is having your son or daughter read a book. I have never graded or scored any child's work. Should parents grade their children on how they walk or talk? Should my parents have graded me because I didn't walk or talk as soon as possible, as my cousin did? Actually, my parents did give me a failing grade when they cared, cared me to my cousin. But that failing grade did not harm me because I was too young to know I'd failed. What would have happened to my feelings about myself if I, if I had known, despite what my parents received as my failing, I was still allowed it? the time to learn at my own pace without being taught I was inferior to someone else. Why is it that when a child fails to learn, we give a failing grade to the child and not to the teacher? Learning takes time. When there's time, it takes place. I also do not test my children in any formal sense since I not, will not be grading them. I do not need to test them because the material the tools they use for learning allow me to see what they do and what they do not understand. If I have introduced a concept during the day, I should say problem out the door is an assessment tool I use. I don't test, but I use this as an assessment tool. <clears throat> if I have introduced a concept during the day and wish to know who understands it and who needs more help, <clears throat> pardon me, I have my water nearby. Water break. Anyway, if I've used if you're a concept during the day and wish to know who understands and who doesn't, I use what I call the problem out the door at the end of the day. I give every student a piece of paper. I then write a problem to be solved for everyone to see on the overhead projector or the chalkboard or wherever. Although my students are always allowed to work together and share answers, the rule for this activity is no talking and no sharing. <clears throat> As each child finds an answer, he or she writes it on his or her paper and hands it to me as he or she leaves the room. If the child has an answer right, I say correct, and the child leaves. If the child's answer shows he or she may have understood but may have rushed too much, done to work too quickly, I say try again and send that child back to his or her desk. 
If the child's answer shows me that he or she does not understand, I say, close enough and send the child out the door. It is that child I was spending extra lessons with the next time, lesson times next day. <clears throat> the reason for no student grouping ability will become apparent is to actually share the specifics of Mary's and lesson, Mary's and my lessons in part four. My reason for becoming a teacher was because I wanted to change how children felt about themselves. The lessons we created were designed to do just that. Now it's time for part four. I would like to give you now a few examples of the math curriculum we created. The purpose of which is to leave every child, pardon me, the purpose of which is to teach every child and never leave a child behind. I said earlier that math was always easy for me, math was always easy for me because of the patterns I saw. The first and most important step to teaching every child is to search for patterns in the math and everywhere else as well. The arrow on the cover is pointing to Mathematics Their Way. Mathematics Their Way is a book written to describe kindergarten through second grade math curriculum by Mary. You can see the arrows pointing, well, first of all, after free exploration, patterns are taught immediately and then twice more during the rest of the time, but patterns, patterns come before everything else. The arrow now points to Mathematics a Way of Thinking. That's the book for third through sixth grade math curriculum. You can see here, after the overview, immediately patterns, pattern searches are introduced. That's the, basically the building block for what comes next. What I will show you now is a sample lesson in place value, something, or something children need to understand to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. It is essential for understanding decimals as well. The math we traditionally teach in school is base 10 math. In Mary's my class, we don't start with base 10. We start with base three, four, five, and sometimes six. The next few slides I will give you, <laughs> the next few slides I show you will give you an example of a beginning place value activity in base four. Mary would use this activity in her first grader for their first graders, and I would use the same beginning activity with my fifth graders as well if my students had not already learned about bases other than 10 in earlier years. Whoops. Let me back up a second. Oh. Okay. Now I know where I am. Okay. This is a trading board. Um, this kind of trading board is what kind I would use in fifth grade because it's hand drawn. In Mary's class, the trading board would already be made, the children would not be expected to draw it, it would already be made for them, but the essence of what the trading board is used for is the same. This is gonna be a trading board used for beans, cups, and bowls. The children in the right-hand column, they draw something as close to looking like a bean as possible in the next column, they do something that's supposed to look more like a cup than a bean. In the third column, they do something that's supposed to look more like a bowl than a cup and a bean. Now, we start with the trading board and learn to read. Its contents right now is no zero cups, probably zero bowls, zero cups, zero beans. This would be read zero, zero, one. Add another bean, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, three. Zero, zero, 004, but this is base four. The rule for base four is you can't have any fours. So you have to put the four in a cup. So it's zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, two, zero, one, three, zero, one, four. Oh, the rule says you can't have fours. Zero, two, zero, zero, two, one, zero, two, two, zero, two, three. 024, oh, can't have fours. 030, 031, 032, 033, 034, can't have fours. Oh, but you can't have four cups either. One bowl and no cups and no beans. 100 or 101, and the progression continues. Now, while the, children do, while the children are doing that and learning 
the teacher is doing the plus one plus one and then has each time she does does he or she does plus one she asks the students to check their neighbors and have them check check their, your neighbor and have your neighbor check you to see if what i've said is clear so that when it comes time to turn the four beans into one cup they all check each other to see if they remember the rule and if they don't remember the rule it's because the teacher hasn't made himself or herself clear now we do that we do we do this in base four and base five and base six till the children really get the concept now when they do the kind of concept with beans and cups and bowls we have this thing called concept mary would phrase it is concept connecting and symbolic the concept in this case would be the beans and cups and bowls but notice when we were doing beans and cups and bowls we didn't have any symbols when the children understand the beans and cups and bowls they then um they then begin using symbols alongside the materials to record what they what the numbers have shown in this particular case the symbols would be numbers when the connection between the materials and symbols is in May, the symbols are used by themselves. Here's an example of the cups and bean patterns in base two, base three, base four, and base five. Now in our classes, we don't do different bases on the same day. We do base a day. We also don't usually do base two. Base two is actually the most common base for computers, but we're not worried about that yet. Now in this case, um, the recording strips for our first grades go much farther than a single bowl. Um, I'm showing, in case you haven't much, okay. Once the symbols are introduced, the symbols are researched for, okay, once the symbols are introduced, the symbols are searched for the patterns they reveal. For the beans and cups, the teacher doesn't say, here's the pattern I want you to see. The teacher says, see what patterns you can find. The patterns seen come from the children, not the teacher. Another of the 10 no's is no students grouping by ability. For everything, including pattern searches, children work in groups of twos or three, not matched by ability, but by who they may be sitting next to or which friends they might want to work with that day. But we do not tell children what patterns to see. We can focus their attention by having them do things like loop the patterns or loop the numbers. Now, I'm not sure how big your computer screens are, if you can see this. So I will tell you like, in base three, the children would have looped, they, number, they loop the numbers when they see the numbers start repeating again. Like in base three, it goes zero, one, two, then goes zero, one, two, then goes zero, one, two. So they would loop the zero, one, two, and zero, one, two, and zero, one, two. Also in the cups column, it goes zero, 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 one, 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 two, two, two. So they loop all the zeros and all the ones and all the twos. It seems that in base three, every loop has three numbers in it. In base four, Every number has four numbers in it. In base five, every number has five numbers in it, or every loop has five numbers in it. Now, I assume that you can see those patterns. Okay. These are the same kind of patterns I would have seen as a student. The difference is when I was a student, I saw patterns right away but I wasn't allowed to share them with anybody. In this case, what the students share with each other isn't their little secret. It will be shared with everybody else as well. Now, if I were to do plus one in base 10, this is what the recording strip would look like. Actually, it would be a long, long, long strip of paper, but this is what the numbers out it would look like. I loved my kindergarten class. It was great, the great first year of school. Spending days doing things like finger painting, playing dodgeball, taking naps, and making friends at school would be with me for years. The only dapic thing, the only academic thing I was learned asked to do in kindergarten was to print out my first name and count to 10. Name printing was an individual activity. Counting to 10 was something we did in front of the class. I could count to 100, but Mrs. Lewis, my teacher, had me stop at 10. When it was my friend Keith Bush's turn, Hit the wrong button. He just recited a few numbers in no particular order. I couldn't understand why he, why he didn't know what the, what the numbers were. I also couldn't understand why Mrs. Lewis, did, pardon me, why Mrs. Lewis didn't teach him the patterns that I saw when I saw the looping patterns for base 10. 
that's what I clicked inadvertently too early on the slide saying, this is what I saw. I saw this in kindergarten, okay? I wasn't some genius in kindergarten. I just was looking for patterns. And that's a pattern that kindergarten, that children in, well, Mary doesn't do bases in different in kindergarten, but in first grade, her first grade children can see this pattern. Would have seen it too if they didn't, if they didn't place value in kindergarten. When I was in school, we were discouraged from helping our classmates with their work. The statement made always was, if you help him, he won't learn how to do it on his own. Back then, it was a teacher's job to teach. It was a student's job to learn. But my friend Keith was a bottom student in kindergarten and a bottom student every year after that. Do you think there were any students in Mary's and my classes who would not see this looping pattern for base 10? And if there were, do you have no doubt that their classmates would have shown it to them if they didn't see it? They would not have hesitated to share it with them. I'm sure my friend Keith would have appreciated their help. I wish I had known then what I know now. The statement made to me by my teachers back then should have been, if you help him, he will learn. Now the activities that come after plus one are described in the Math Their Way and Math Their Way of Thinking books, um, which by the way, are available as free downloads from the center's web website. Just click on any book's cover to see a PDF copy a downloadable PF copy of the book. There are three reasons why I teach different bases. First, when I introduce an activity in base four or base five, not every student may understand. When I introduce the same activity the following day in a different base, the children who understood on day one will still understand on day two, even when the base has changed. These students now become teachers for their classmates. With more teachers, more children will come to understand and in turn be available as teachers. For any classmate who still needs help on day three, sometimes, I mean, now there are way more teachers. Sometimes everyone will understand on day one, but even more, but for even more of the difficult concepts, I never, I've never had to take longer than three days to bring everybody along. However, if it turns out day four is needed, there are more bases to be used. Second, we will see patterns on day one. Would you see the same patterns again on day two or three? Seeing other, searching other bases for patterns to reveal and sharing with everyone makes the patterns we find in base 10 easy for the whole class. Third, if I simply announce to all my students, parents, that I was not, will not move on ahead with any lesson until every child understands, what do you think the reaction would be from the parents of the top students? or even from the top, top students themselves. How can you possibly hold my child back? But teaching in different bases is not holding anybody back. I tell my class that students don't usually learn about different bases until they're at least in high school. All my students are impressed, including the top ones. The parents are impressed as well. Different bases allow the children who catch on faster to never feel they're being held back by classmates who are learning needs more time. Students helping students doesn't keep the top students from being top students. It just makes more students at the top. These tiles represent the multiplication problem three times four. But in which base should we write the answer? In base 10, it's 12. Here it is in bases three, four, and five. In base three, it's one, one, zero. In base four, it's 30. In base five, it's one, four. When I introduce multiplication matrix to my students, I do not start with base 10. There are, these are the first matrices I have my, have my students fill in. Notice it's base three and base four and base five. My students fill in bases They've also fill in bases for six, seven, eight, and nine as well. We'll eventually get to base 10, but bases three through nine come first. They work in groups of twos and threes to fill in each matrix in its turn. They use the sets of tiles that each student already has in his or her desk to make a tile model of each multiplication problem and then convert the tiles that are the answer to its base equivalent. Any multiplication problem pre presents just three numbers, length, 
times width equals area. Any set of these three numbers can be modeled in the same way, regardless of the base. Any multiplication matrix, regardless of its base, simply represents a series of length times width equals areas problems. For those of you watching this talk, this may seem a bit overwhelming if you've never worked in base other than 10, but it's no problem for my students at all. This is a blank multiplication matrix, okay? Uh, if you were faced with having to fill in this matrix from base 3 to 10, it might seem like an overwhelming task. But the more matrices your child completes, the easier new matrix becomes, all right? Now, um, we look for patterns everywhere all year long. But I want to do one thing first. I'm going to go back. Okay. I forgot this. My, my slide thing forgot to tell me that I did this. Okay, now I'm going to back the slide up one more. I'm supposed to rerun slides and also keep track of where I am in my talk. So I'll go back to this thing. This is a base thing for uh, matrix. What I want to give you an example uh, is how the children actually fill it in in case you think it may be too hard, say, for first grade. It's not that we do this in first grade, but see if you can manage this. Remember, multiplication is base times, I mean, length times width equals area. This is length of one, side of one, area is one. Length of one, side of two, area two. Length of one, side of three, area three. Length of one, side of four, but this is base four, so four is written one oh. Length of one, side of one one, which is four plus one. Now we'll do the same thing down this way because, the, the, by the way, the children work these out with their tiles. Here's a row of tiles. Okay, now they have two tiles, three tiles, four tiles in a column, five tiles. Just for some of it, we're going to build a square. Here's a two by two square. How many tiles in the two by two square? Well, they're four. Can't have four in base four, so it's one zero. Nine squares, two one. Oh, it's interesting. Four squares times four squares is 16, but apparently base four, 10 times 10 is 100. And one times one is 121. This is what I filled out so far. Can you picture how you would, if you were given this assignment, fill the rest of the squares out just using tiles to find the areas? Length times width equals area. Now, every child in my class understands bases, okay? because we never move forward in any step until there, if there's a child who does not. We really, really do not ever leave a child behind. Now, in this case, some children will finish base three sooner than others. That's okay. When they finish base three, they go on to base four. Each, each group works at its own race. Now, when any group finishes, when every group finishes base three, I have one group read the numbers on its table to me and I record the numbers on my copy of the base three matrix. All other groups check their base matrices to see if they agree. If they don't, we then work it out. We just sort it out. Now, this is all, this is base three, base four, base five, all filled in. You can see how base four got filled in. Now, if you were faced with having to fill in multiplication matrices all the way to base from base three to 10, as I say, it might seem overwhelming, but the more matrices the children complete, the easier each new matrix becomes. We look for patterns everywhere all year long. As the children work, I ask them to see which patterns on the matrix they have completed they think will appear again on the next matrix. There are patterns to apply that apply only to even number bases, and patterns that are common only to odd number bases, and patterns that are common to every base, including 10. Here are the base 6 and base 7 matrices filled in with the patterns that students can already see from bases 3, 4, and 5. The, it's like most of the work is now done from the bases they've already done. Okay. These are bases used by patterns, by, by patterns that my students can do very quickly because they're already familiar with patterns and because they know to look for patterns they've already completed. Now, you can see how many few faces remain to fill in. I have filled in the patterns that you can rarely, this is a base 10 matrix. I filled in the patterns that you can already see just from the early matrices. How much of this base 10 matrix do you think my children in my classroom can fill out using the patterns they have seen from bases three through nine? For my students, the answer is all of it. 
when learning becomes a shared search for patterns with everyone sharing equally what is found with everybody else, every child is involved in every other child's learning and every child learns. In place of textbooks and workbooks in my classroom, we fill our, we fill our room with teaching materials like beans and cups and bowls and Unifix cubes and geoboards and pattern blocks and ceramic counting tiles and toothpicks and lima beans, dice cubes, tangrams, and more. In Mary's kindergarten and first grade classrooms, children also use what Mary calls junk boxes for pattern searches, sorting, classifying, sorting and classifying and counting. The objects in her junk box are just things children find around their homes. Buttons, pebbles, plants, seeds, coins, bottle caps, keys, and more. This picture is from the back cover of the book Mathematics Their Way. It's an example of the junk, actually it's a picture of Mary's junk boxes. When the search for patterns in, as a foundation, no teacher is provided and children not separated from one another by ability, every child learns and no child is ever left behind. When I was a student, I was taught formulas, <clears throat> like the one for finding the area of a triangle. It's something to be memorized. In my class, we don't memorize, we understand. Understanding does not have to be memorized. Now, that's what happens when you click one button too early. And also at the same time, open your, okay, let's see. Okay, if I push one button, it moves the slides, I push another button, it elevates the notes that I'm reading from. Students in my class, and that's why I put that slide back. Students in my class use their geoboards to figure out the areas of various triangles. For each area they find, I have them make a list of each new triangle's base, height, and area. After they have found a few areas, I have them look for a pattern in the numbers. When they know the base and height, they can predict the area. When any student thinks he or she has found a pattern that will let them predict, we have everybody else check the pattern with the numbers that they have and see if that answer, if that pattern works. If the pattern works, I show them how mathematicians record the pattern with letters. Like now, it's ready for this one. That's the formula that my children, that formula and all kinds of other formulas my children can easily discover from just looking for patterns and not having to memorize anything. Rather than teach my students rules for multiplying and dividing fractions, my students use either the tiles or the geoboards to search for patterns to discover the rules for themselves. Every formula that we see in an elementary school classroom that we as students were long ago told to memorize is simply a way of recording a pattern that some earlier mathematicians saw long ago. Students sharing their knowledge with another are just as capable of discovering, discovering every formula for themselves. In high school area, in high school algebra, I was taught to solve this problem. A plus B squared equals A squared plus two AB plus B. I remember that my first lesson in algebra was learning this and memorizing it. Why wasn't I shown this instead? This is a plus b squared. Remember, multiplication is just length times width equals area. This square has a side of a plus b and another side of a plus b. That's a plus b times a plus b or a plus b squared. And look, oh, there are two a's in there. There's an a square in there and there's a b squared in there. And then there's an a b, an a, b piece and an a b piece. It is a squared plus two a b's and, and b, b squared. Why wasn't I shown this in school and given, math can be memorized or it can be understood. Not all, not all students are equally good at memorizing, but all students are equally capable of understanding. It is said that children have different learning styles. However, before they come to school, all children seem to learn in the same way, but school doesn't teach the way children learn. The children who do well in school are good at learning the school way, and children who don't do well in school don't learn that way. So it seems that if learning styles exist, they have more to do with how well or poorly children will do in school than how well or poorly students learn outside of school. Do I, as a teacher, pay any attention to learning styles? No. <clears throat> 
The world over when parents teach their children to talk or rather watch them learn to talk, do they need to think about the infant's learning style? Or do they just need to talk and talk and talk to the child and be very pleased with the almost words the child says back? My fifth graders did so well in the math test because they had all helped each other learn. They were all taught the same way using the same materials. They may have had different learning styles, but regardless of how they absorbed the information, the materials they used were all the same. All we need to do is set up the learning environment and then let our students help each other learn. When we do that, every child learns with no child left behind. One last note. I have mentioned Mary a lot in this talk. Those of you unfamiliar with the center or its history may not know that Mary passed away in 1978. On the center's homepage is a book entitled Mathematics Their Way Summary Newsletter. Click on that book's cover. And you'll see an arrow pointing to the tribute that I wrote about Mary. It also is a PDF download. My favorite picture of Mary and me is of me. I was in the Navy and when I was in the Navy, um, I was on an aircraft carrier and the aircraft carrier would occasionally have dependent state cruises and anybody who was a dependent could get on the carrier and go out for a cruise. Well, the carrier would have no way of knowing who was independent. So when my carrier had a dependent day, day cruise was very close to where Mary and I lived. We simply got on the carrier and took a ride. This is us pictured on the carrier or well, the carrier is now a museum in San Diego called the USS Midway. This is my favorite picture of Mary and me. Just two classroom teachers who ended up being permission, being given permission to create our own curriculum. Oh, you're back. Hello. Uh, hi, hi, Bob. Thank hey. you. Uh, Thank you for uh, this uh, very th thought-provoking um, presentation, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it is uh, uh, you've really op opened up the the doorways of our thoughts uh, of how we how we look at the classroom, how we look at children, and you know the the amazing capabilities which children have. Uh, it is. Uh, Often we we underestimate uh, how amazing the capacities of children are, but you really demonstrated uh, uh, through through your uh, presentation that it is uh, truly important that if you want every child to uh, make sure that no child is left behind, it is important to b believe in that uh, immense strength of the, every child. So thank you for uh, sharing this presentation. Um, uh, we we uh, we had some questions. Uh, for for okay. your uh, I like questions, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, uh, the first question is to do with uh, teacher cre creating our own curriculum. Correct. Uh, it is um, it, it la la like like you've shown it and you've uh, you've uh, you know demonstrated it and uh, and and with, with so much success. Um, it is a courageous idea for, for a teacher to go and say that I'm going to create my own curriculum. Uh, could you take us through that process of from from the idea of like of the the conception of this idea that I'm going to take my make my own curriculum, uh, and going all the way through uh, the various stakeholders in the school education system, conversation with the school head. Um, how? How, how was that process for you? Uh, and what would your message be for teachers who are now inspired to say that, all right, I, I would like to do something as well for my class? One of the things is like, when Mary and I were given permission to create our own curriculum, we also knew that no matter how successful we were creating it, we couldn't get anybody in authority to listen to us because we were just classroom teachers which is why we wrote books. We were still the same classroom teachers, but we knew if we wrote books, you know what I said at the start, I didn't want you to introduce me. 
because then you can say, oh, they're this and this and this. He's this important person or that important person. Well, I had to be that important person to get people to listen to the curriculum. I had to make myself pretend to be important by writing books. I was doing exactly the same thing. I did my classroom teacher. I was doing exactly the same thing as a classroom teacher when I wrote books. But when I wrote book, or when Mary and I wrote books, we then became authorities, but we were just classroom teachers. Okay. Now the problem that the reason I give this talk is what I want is for the people in power to give classroom teachers a chance. Mary and I were lucky enough to be given a chance. We were not qualified. I mean, I can. My, I was a swimming coach. Mary was a librarian. We were picked because because we had no education background. Okay, who's going to give a teacher like that a chance? They gave us a chance because they were running an experiment to see if it worked. And by the way, only of the twenty-four intern teachers, there were twenty-four of us all together. Only two ended up doing anything differently than it had been through a regular program. Okay, the other twenty-two teachers. Ended up, that, like when I mentioned Mary couldn't do this when she was team teaching because that teacher wasn't going to give up. I mean, it takes a little bit of, I mean, I may not have known anything about education, but what I brought with me was nerve. I was willing to say, okay, if this doesn't work, I'm not going to use it. Now, what can I make up? But that's a difficult thing to ask a teacher to do. Okay, that's why Mary and I knew what we were, when we knew what we were doing, what other, what other teachers would have done if they were given the chance. But we were given the chance and they weren't okay for other teachers to do what mary and i did the people in charge have to believe in teachers right now they don't believe in teachers you know mary's intern supervisors rated her as she'll never be a teacher her rating as intern supervisors they said mary will never be a teacher that's because they were mad at her because i got her i got her out of that team teaching situation her principal gave her outstanding rating. She had the best rating of all the interns as a teacher, but her our supervisors gave her a bad rating. So it's like the people in charge didn't like the fact I talked them out of something. You have to get people in charge that are willing to trust you. Right now, people in charge don't trust teachers. They try to tell teachers what to do. It's very difficult. I mean, that's why we get with what the center was for the reason we set the center up is so we could support teachers in doing what we were doing. If it wasn't for the center, if it was just these teachers, if I went to the teacher next door and said, here, do this, the teacher would say, yeah, sure. My parents will never accept this. Okay, the parents of my students will never accept this. Okay, but now the author comes in and says, here's this internationally known book. I'm using this in my classroom. Okay, we made the center to support teachers in being teachers. The problem is districts don't support teachers and being teachers. Principal don't support teachers being teachers. Publishers definitely don't support teachers being teachers. They don't want them to be teachers. They want to give them books. I'm tutoring a friend's daughter right now in eighth grade math because um, she asked, she, the parents asked for a tutor and, and I said, I'll do that because it's interesting. But it's, it's, and I told her, you know, I'm going to tell you I hate your book. Okay. Just live with that. I'm going to help you with this stuff, but I think your book is terrible. Okay. And now that I've actually seen her book, it's worse than I thought. It is teaching her nonsense. Okay. Now her teacher has to do this because someone gave her the, the teacher, you know, I mentioned that Mary was no good at math and she was much able to more to relate to teachers. Elementary school teachers in America generally don't have a, big, a good math background. At one point, I read that the average elementary school teacher in America has had no math since geometry in high school. So when they're taught to teach math, they're going to use the book they're given. What Mary and I gave them was a book by a person who was as ignorant as they were at the start about math. And they could see because she learned to do it, oh, this makes sense now. It's like what teachers like about what we do is this, they wish they'd been taught that way. You know, my friend Keith Bush that I mentioned would love to have been taught that way, but he was, you know, it's just ridiculous how we teach. We don't let teachers be teachers. Now, I can't help a teacher unless the administrators help a teacher. I can help a teacher by giving a teacher workshops. Like we never gave, we only gave workshops where we were invited. Okay. That's a long answer, but the answer is we have to get administrators 
and what, forget the publishers. You have to get administrators to start letting teachers think about what's best for the children. And that's something that teachers don't have the power to do, which is why Mary and I wrote books. As, without books, we didn't have that power. Just that simple. That was a long answer. I'll try to be shorter next time. Maybe people have, uh, maybe people have bedtime. So you guys are all just uh, getting up. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, a little darker, it's a little darker where I am. We, we are being selfish by getting the, the maximum words and ideas out of you here. No, I, you can, um, you can, I will try to give such long answers because I would talk all night if you asked me to. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but the thing about, you know, uh, a challenge of convincing uh, school leaders, of con convincing parents, right? And, you know, like so much energy and time spent on convincing people when do we get the time to actually spend with children. Uh, uh, do you feel uh, that uh, this is a challenge which we face here in India and across the world? Everywhere. Uh, everywhere, like, everywhere, like you said. Uh, does getting policy, the policymakers, administrators, and uh, parents to come inside the classroom and observe from within, uh, has the, would that help? Well, the problem is the parents were taught like the teachers are teaching. Okay. The parents who did well in school don't see that school didn't teach them. I did well in school because of the background I brought with me to school. I, and often in workshops, I say, I don't teach nonsense. Okay. I was taught nonsense, but remember, I was a top student. A top student meant, a top student meant I was good at learning nonsense. Okay. We teach nonsense. Well, the parents that come to school, they still think the 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 answer is the teaching is in those books that somehow the people who wrote those books know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing except for how to sell books. I mean, textbooks. If you, you want to, what you, I don't think we have to, we have to teach parents that it is possible for everybody to learn. Kids stop learning when they go to school. They're doing fine till they get there. Then they start learning that they're not smart. They were perfectly smart till they got there. So it's a matter of education, you know, that's why we give workshops for teachers. I mean, the fact that we give workshops for teachers is, oh, we learned this at a workshop and this, this you know, or I even showed at the top, I showed at the start, just the test, just the test result from my class. When there were test results from my class, other teachers at school, at Mary's in my school, actually began to pay attention to what I was doing. Before then, there was no way of their seeing that what I was doing was actually working. That's why the talks with that, those were test results. Okay, this works. You can abandon the textbooks, you can abandon the workbooks, you can abandon raising your hands, you can abandon all that stuff and your children will do better. So teachers should start by saying, I saw this talk, this person did this and here are the results they got in his classroom. Start with using me as a reference because remember I'm now the expert. Even though I'm just another classroom teacher, I've tried to make myself an expert so that other people can actually say, well, he did it and he's known not just a teacher next door, but he's known. So look at my classroom results. We're trying to give teachers good ability. We're trying to be teachers giving teachers good ability, but that's hard because people don't really trust us. Uh, you, you also talked about your thoughts on uh, assessment, that uh, assessments uh, in the traditional sense is something which um, which is not a part of your day-to-day -day classroom, but you're looking at other aspects of uh, filling the classroom with uh, with uh, teaching learning materials and processes which make I'll, assessment. I'll give you an example. You know that example I gave with the, the beans and cups? Well, when the children are doing this thing with the beans and cup, you're, the teacher says plus one. Every time the teacher says plus one, the children add a bean, and then the teacher says, and read me what you have. And they all read, they read what they have, okay? And, and, and but it goes plus one, then they do plus one, check your neighbor and see if your neighbor have Nick that you, did you all get did plus one? You all understood that. Now at the point when it gets plus one, you now have four and it's gonna be exchanged. Plus one, see if you can remember what the instructions and the instructions, what the rules say to do without saying, put them all in a cup. See if you can remember, and now check your neighbor and have your neighbor check you and see if you all remembered what that rule said to do. Okay, so they're constantly looking at each other and the teacher can also, because they're using material, the teacher can constantly see what they understand. Okay, because they're using materials, you can see what they're doing. Okay, there's an example we use, a short example, there's an example we use in a workshop. 
It's called Building Behind a Shield. I am the teacher in the front of the, and our workshops are run like classrooms. So all the people in the work, all the students, all the teachers are basically students in a classroom. I'm now the teacher in the front of the room and I'm building something behind a shield. We'll say, you know what, you know what uh, cuisine, or, cuisine or rods are? Or just some kind of material like pattern block shapes or something like that. You're building a shape behind the shield. Now everyone in class is building a shape behind their shield too with materials. So you give an instruction, okay? And they have to follow your instruction. And they can't ask you any questions. So you say, I want you to do this and this and this. And they try to follow the same instructions in, behind their shield. Okay. And they end up actually, we had students do this, and this teachers do this for each other. <clears throat> then you pick them, you shield up and look and see if the person followed your instructions well. <clears throat> and you will see that none of them have because your instructions weren't clear and they couldn't even ask questions. So the next time we do it, they can ask questions. They still can't see what each other is doing. They can now ask questions like when you said parallel, did you mean parallel to this or parallel to that? Or what do you mean by on top? You know, that kind of stuff. I mean, top mean in front of or, or, or they can ask questions now, but they still can't see what's being built. Then the third time through, only the teacher has a shield. Everyone else can see everybody else's materials. Now, when you give instructions, everybody can see what everybody thinks the instructions means. And now they can say, is this what you meant? And they can point and say, did you mean this? Or did, you, did you mean that? That's an example we give to teachers for why it's important to have kids meet, see, use materials, so you can see what they're doing with your words. When they can't, when you're just using words and symbols and stuff, you can't see if they understand. When you have them use materials, you can see if they understand. That's the assessment. Giving them materials and then watching what they do with them. <clears throat> okay, short answer for that. Ask me a right. For me, that's um, short. for me that's short. <laughs> uh, 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 a, a follow-up on assessments. Um, my what the sense we get is that what what you have uh, what you have done is to make assessments um, low stake, continuous, and very very effective. Um, it's we, like we you're the, the girl swing the crying girl. Just yes. making it so making all I had to do was take the fear away from her, and that she could then do things. She could try things. She wouldn't fail. You have to make it so that when a child is doing something, there's no failure associated with it. You learn better that way, a lot better. Yeah, the, the fear, the, the fear yeah. has essentially gone away. Uh, and a, a lot of the concepts, when you talked about the, the base of uh, four all the way uh, to 10 to teach place value, you're right. also transcending the different grades of what is taught in specific grades. Yeah. What, what, is, what is your advice or what is uh, your take on these very high stake exams, which determine whether the child moves from grade three to four, uh, some, you know, some eight was, how, how, how do we deal with that? My view of that is that's a measure of bad teaching. Remember the teacher, remember we, my view is if a child isn't learning, we should grade the teacher, not the child. If you're testing a child on something the child doesn't know or doesn't learn, why aren't you teaching that child that thing instead of testing the child to see if he, she, he or she doesn't know it? Why is there a test of things the child doesn't know? Why haven't you taught that child? In my classroom, you know, that example I gave, uh, that I gave one slide to where I had to backtrack where I was showing the, the pattern counting by 10 that my friend Keith couldn't see. My friend Keith in kindergarten couldn't see that problem. Everyone in Mary's kindergarten, first grade possible with classroom, see that without any problem at all. There wouldn't be people who didn't understand. What we do is fail to teach and then measure our failure. That's what those tests do. If we really don't want to leave a child behind, then how is there a test that leaves children behind? The problem is the test, not the child. We should be teaching so that whatever is on that test, every child knows. That's not what we're doing, which is why the test is a failure. It measures how we failed as teachers. Not that you can take that bank and they say that, spin that around loosely, but basically tests that don't show every child learning measure our failures as teachers, not the children's failure to learn. Because every child was capable of learning if we just found out how to teach him or her. 
Thanks for sharing your thought on that. Uh, yeah, before we let, <laughs> uh, we, we'll still not let you go and uh, uh, have you take uh, two more questions. One is sure. also from the audience. But before we we go to the that audience question, uh, uh, at at one point of your presentation, you uh, attracted the audience's attention towards you folding hands uh, in, yeah, the, yeah, in the yeah, classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we saw the first two rows just frozen uh, in yeah. a way. Could you please elaborate a bit on, on that and what, what was the psychology uh, of well, that class? Well, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, what was what was the class like? Or like, be more specific, I mean, what was that class like? Why were they turning? Yeah. What? You, you said, look at the first two rows and they didn't seem to be turning behind. Uh, That's it, correct, it they didn't. Yes, yeah. What was, what the problem? The point of that was they didn't turn around. They were not involved. They knew where the answers were coming from. They knew when the question was asked, they knew who was going to answer the question. I mean, that little girl who shot her arm up right away, that's me. I, I, my hand would have gone up immediately. You know, I was a top student kind. I'm going to answer the question. The other kids know they don't need to do anything because they're not going to get called on. They know who's going to answer the question. Remember, there was one question. How many children are in this room? Well, you can't get... Now, the children, you can't get 35 answers. Not 35 different people are going to give you an answer. So they know where the answer is going to come from. So they don't even have to be involved. That's what's wrong with that question. And that's what's wrong with teaching. We're supposed to, if we want every child to learn, we have to get every child involved. By my saying how many children are in this room and then having children raise their hands automatically left all kinds of children, and particularly the children in the first two rows, uninvolved. The same question with, okay, everybody take out your notebook and write the answer to how many people are in this, how many children are in this room, then what happens? Now the children in the first two rows have to write an answer in their book. Now they have to turn around and count. Before it was a class answer, they didn't have to be involved. They weren't involved. They aren't involved. And they aren't involved in lots and lots of school. When we raise hands in school, how many in classroom of kids, say 35, 35 kids, teacher says, what's the answer to this? And people raise their hands. How many are going to call, how many people are going to get called on? One. What happens to the other 34 kids in the class? But if you want them to all be involved, then get them all involved. Don't have kids raise their hands. That leaves people out. Thank, thanks for elaborating that again. A um, uh, uh, truly remarkable example. We, we would like to take one question uh, from one of our uh, live listeners. Uh, Mosina Mirza uh, is, is asking, what can be the learning experiences for children that reflect the application of mathematics to other curriculum areas? And uh, th this was... Th I'm waving. <laughs> you can see this in the video, I'm waving at your picture. Oh, pardon me, I'm not being sexist. You're cute too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, but but uh, just to just to add uh, because I had something similar. Just to add to Mosina's question, you talked about patterns in math. Uh, is that something which which could also be uh, looked at for learning other disciplines as well? Uh, your I'll thoughts. give you an example. Uh, it is the foundation of learning. Picture this. The, mind, the human mind is a pattern-seeking device. I'll give you an example. Uh, a child is learning to talk. It's learned the word car. What does car mean? What is a car and what is not a car? What is a car? What is a truck? What is a car? What is a station wagon? What is a car? What is an ambulance? What is a car? And what is a horse character? I mean, it's like when a child is learning language, the child, child is ha constantly having to sort out what is the definition of this word, looking for the patterns in that word, okay? Child looks for, basically the child is using patterns and learning what a car is and what a car isn't. What's a boy, what's a girl? There are some pretty easy patterns there, okay? But it's like, we use patterns all the time. And picture biology. Um, one of the things that would, in, a bit more specifically, in when I first wrote Mathematics Their Way, pardon me, when I first wrote Mathematics Their Way of Thinking, there was a science chapter in it, linking the math lessons to science. 
the publisher decided it didn't need a science chapter, so he took it out. There's a manuscript on the center's website called Patterns and Connections in Mathematics, okay? It has a science chapter in it, linking the math to the science, all right? So that person can look in the Patterns and Connections book and look for the science chapter and see the math and science link. But also, what is what doesn't show in the examples I gave, one of the first activities in, in Mary's book is sorting and classification. That's part of mathematics, all right? It's also a chapter in my book. Now, sorting and classification, where do you think sorting and classification is used outside of mathematics? Like everywhere, like biology, like what's a plant, what's an animal, what's a dog, what's a cat? All those things are sorting and kind of dogs are this and it's a broad category, cats are this, horses are this, donkeys are that, cows are this, sheep are that. That's all sorting and classification, that's all part of mathematics. Mathematics is so prevalent in our society, we tend to think, like I was at a, a beauty parlor once with my godsons were little getting their hair cut and stuff like that, and the woman, I was telling her that I, I taught math and things like that, she said she was terrible at math. I said, you can't run your business if you're terrible at math. You use math all the time in your business, ordering supplies, making appointments. I said, a child cannot cross the street when children, when children, children, Unfortunately, children, children are little. They can't cross the street without holding a mother or father's hand. Why are they holding that parent's hand? Why can't they cross the street by themselves? Because they don't yet know the math in distances and speed. When we look down the street and see a car coming, particularly in India, like, like in Lucknow or places like that, you had to do a lot, of, a lot of math and getting just across the street. But you cannot cross the street if you don't know to use math. You use math all the time. You're just not aware of it because we think of math as school math, the ridiculous things we were taught in school. But math is how you, it's how we knew when to meet for this talk. Okay. It's like we both had to use our own math, make, okay, he's doing math, I'm doing math. Now we can do link. Use math to get to an appointment. Use math, use all the time. It's all the time everywhere. You just have to be more aware of the math all around you. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't give short answers, but what the heck? The, uh, we, we clearly, I clearly had a quick uh, uh, challenge with respect to the time differences, but you made it me uh, made it for me very easy with that chart, which gave sure, a California yeah. in the sun. Because that, the time differences meant a math problem. It was an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, particularly <laughs> because the half hour thing with India split down the middle. They, they, they were, India is really two different time zones, but they made it, that was too much trouble. So they just put time, divided the time zone in half took half of one and half the other and said, we're the middle, which is a very good solution to that problem. That was math. <laughs> Bob, it's it's been truly an honor uh, for us here to host you today. Uh, if uh, if people want to um, reach out to you, uh, they have questions. I'm sure a, a lot of uh, you'll see a lot of teachers, young people inspired and fired up after this talk are uh, already to experiment in their classrooms. How how best can they reach out to you if they have any um, I gave you? right at the start, I gave an email address that I will give you again now. And also, I'm going to put a link to this video on the center's website. And in the link will also be an email address where they can contact me. Okay. So it'll be visible on the website. Um, it, the website should be one. I, all I have to do is go through this and put down the minutes thing happen and stuff like that. But the web address is info, I N F O, short for information, at center, as I said before, spelled the USA way, C E N T E R dot E D U, short for education, info at center dot E D U. Thank you. And we, we'll, we're now just uh, displaying that ah, at the bottom of the screen also. Spelled right. <laughs> spelled wrong, depending on where yeah. you are. Spelled right for America, wrong for India. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so it, it is the I'm American way of Very good. Good technology. <laughs> Uh, so uh, to, to all those who are watching this live and who uh, uh, in the coming time will be watching this as well, uh, we, we hope that uh, you've had, uh, you've learned a lot from uh, this uh, very important talk. And if there are any questions or any thoughts which you would like to share with Bob, please do email at uh, info at the center.edu as mentioned at the bottom of the screen. Um, so uh, I can say one thing, you were very patient yes. watching me sometimes. I was running two things. One was the notes I was looking, and the other was the buttons for the slides. 
And occasionally I would get the wrong button pushed and the slides would move up to or the notes would jump too fast. And I missed, I missed one little section at one point when I talked about the, the, the third way to, like one of the ways to, uh, why for different bases. But I figured, nah, I won't go back to that. They can ask me later. <laughs> and and absolutely, uh, Bob, uh, it's, it's been truly inspiring. And, and uh, uh, we are very, uh, we will be very excited to host you again uh, uh, whenever uh, you would uh, have the time and uh, you would like to share. So uh, truly, Mr. Bob Barata Lawton, uh, okay. it's, uh, it's been uh, an awesome time for us. And thank you really for really opening up uh, the horizons of uh, uh, not just math teachers, but educators, policymakers, administrators, completely on the, uh, you, you've really shown um, uh, a, a road less taken, but a road really much more enlightening. Thank, thank you so much. And if you'd like to share any concluding I, thoughts. More so. teachers get the opportunity to be teachers like I was given. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. You're in charge of this. <laughs> You're the host. Thank, <laughs> thank, Wait, thank you, thank you, Bob. Thing. I'm waving like this. When I was first in India, I sometimes used to wave like this for bye-bye and learn not to do that because i did that to a child once who was waving like that and he came over to me okay because he thought i meant right. come here so i now just <laughs> sideways fortunately i spoke enough hindi to talk to him when he came over absolutely but that's the last time i waved that way right <laughs> sideways wave thank you thank you so much bob really nice having you here thank you